How many of you have gotten sucked into a BuzzFeed quiz? I mean, you know, you're just innocently scanning your Facebook newsfeed when suddenly you have an overwhelming desire to know which 90s alternative rock song are you or how Oprah are you? I mean, am I the only person this happens to? I I'm pretty sure I'm not. I'm embarrassed to admit how many I've taken, so I'm not gonna tell you. I'm just gonna give you a few of my results for your listening pleasure. Here we go. Uh, since the movie just came out, I thought it would be good to know which Avenger are you. I got Captain America. Okay, I have to admit, I, I don't know much of anything about the Avengers, so is that good? I mean, it sounds like it would be good. Although when I answered the question, which Avenger would you most like to kiss by picking Robert Downey Jr., I wasn't expecting to end up with Captain America. Or how about this one? Any Gilmore Girls fans out there? I mean, come on, man, it's Mother's Day, you can admit it. I took the Are You More Lorelei or Rory Gilmore quiz, and, and I was sure that I would get Rory, but it turns out that I'm more Lorelei. I mean, who knew? And I certainly wasn't expecting this. Which famous cereal mascot are you? I got that angry apple from the Apple Jacks commercial. Now, I'm not sure what that means or how I got that result, but I promise I'll look into counseling because of it. Uh, the funny thing about these quizzes is that some are a little lame, some are funny, and others are just plain dumb. But the question is, why do we find ourselves drawn to these silly things? I mean, why do we take time away from our busy lives, maybe even our work, to scroll through pages of questions that, that really don't amount to much? I mean, could it be that they hit on something each of us wrestles with all the way down to the core of our being? I mean, maybe it's because these quizzes pretend to answer the age-old question, who am I? Well, today we're starting a series called Masterpiece that's all about our primary identity as Christ followers. And it's about that journey every single person goes through to figure out just who they are. And some of us spend a lifetime trying to figure it out on our own. But during this series, we want to help one another find it in Christ. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time throughout this series in the book of the Bible called Ephesians. Ephesians is actually a letter written to a church in a city called Ephesus. And a guy named Paul, who was once a part of that church, wrote this letter around 60 AD. And he wrote it to instruct and encourage the Christ followers there. Now, since this letter was written to a particular city, it might be helpful to know a little bit about the culture. You see, Ephesus was a large, prosperous harbor city that contained one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis. I mean, life itself for many people that lived in Ephesus, it just circled around this temple from commerce to worship to tourism to even careers. The people of Ephesus found a large part of their identity in the temple and in the city where they lived. But my guess is the Ephesians were a lot like us, people on a journey wondering, who am I? And in his letter to them, Paul spends a lot of time reminding these Ephesian Christ followers and us the truth about their identity. Well, in the opening of the letter, Paul writes this. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Do you want to know the answer to the question, who am I? Well, if you are a Christ follower, the primary answer is not found in your job or your relationships or your bank account. You won't discover your true identity by working harder or dressing sharper or parenting smarter. In fact, there's really nothing you can do to define the most important thing about you, except to embrace it. You see, because as Christ followers, our primary identity is not built on something we do, but on something that's already been done. Through Jesus Christ, you have been adopted as God's son, as his daughter. You are a child of God. I mean, think about what that means to be adopted. Adoption bestows on a child a new name, a new legal standing, new familial relationships. I mean, that is what has been given to us in Christ. We have a new name as God's child. We stand before him holy and blameless in his sight. We are part of his family. 
Our identity, it's not based on something we do, but on something that's already been done. I mean, do you understand that this is the unique message of Christianity? I mean, this is the gospel message. This is the good news. You don't have to strive anymore. You don't have to earn anymore. You don't have to compete anymore. Your identity is built on something that's already been done for you. A pastor and theologian, Tim Keller, describes it this way. He says, a gospel is an announcement of something that has happened in history, something that's been done that changes your status forever. Other religions say, this is what you have to do in order to connect to God forever, or this is how you have to live in order to earn your way to God. But the gospel says, this is what has been done in history. This is how Jesus lived and died to earn the way to God for you. You are God's adopted son. You are God's adopted daughter. You are a child of God. That is your primary identity. I mean, right out of the gate, Paul starts his letters by, by reminding the Ephesians of this truth. And my guess is they needed to be reminded. I mean, losing sight of your primary identity must have been a problem 2,000 years ago. And I think it's still a problem today. I mean, there's something that trips us up when it comes to identity. Sometimes we allow our identity to be based on labels. I mean, they may be labels that, that others have placed on us or they can be labels that we've given to ourselves. And so often these labels, they're, they're not a true representation of who we are at all. I mean, in high school, we wore labels like these, like jock or, or prom queen or, or band geek. Now, of course, we didn't wear the, the physical labels in high school, but we might as well have. I mean, everyone knew exactly what label fit each of us. The problem is most of us didn't remove these labels when we graduated. Most of us have worn labels like these for many years, maybe even our entire lives. I mean, only now they might say things like, like disappointment or, or ugly or, or unworthy. Or maybe we wear positive labels, things that say things like successful or stylish or overachiever. We may even have sought out the labels we desire. We've looked to our, our career or possessions or appearance or achievements or even our relationships to give us a sense of identity. We've grown so used to these labels that we see them as the defining marks of our identity. I mean, whether we like our labels or we despise them, we let these labels define who we are. You know, for me, I know I've worn lots of labels. I mean, some are labels I've been given, some I put on myself. And my collection of labels might read something like this, leader, teacher, not good enough, unimportant, alone. You see, I feel most confident in my job, so I, I carry a lot of my identity in being a leader and a teacher in the church. But even in that, sometimes I feel trapped in the cycle of, of wanting affirmation and recognition that, that don't always seem to come, and then I can start labeling myself with words like not good enough and unimportant. You know, as a single adult who lives far away from family, there are days where I really feel like I'm wearing a label that says alone. I mean, there are some real problems with looking to these labels to define our identity. I mean, even if we like some of the labels we wear, they can still trip us up and tear us down. I mean, first of all, many of the things we build our identity on are temporary. I mean, if that job or that person or that possession is taken from us, it can rip apart our whole person. And the other thing is, I mean, people are fickle, aren't they? I mean, today they can label you one thing, but tomorrow it'll be something else. And it's like a, a never-ending barrage of waves trying to relentlessly define and then redefine ourselves again. Perhaps an even bigger problem is that these labels put us in constant competition with each other. I mean, if I'm looking for my identity and success, I need to be more successful than you. If I'm looking for my identity and appearance, I have to look better than you. And all of a sudden, my whole perspective on who I am is just inextricably tied to how I compare to you. I mean, competition might be something we commonly associate with men because as a stereotype, guys are often seen as the ultra-competitive gender. But research from psychologist Joyce Benenson begs to differ. 
She spent 25 years studying the different ways that men and women compete. And true, guys might battle it out in visible, aggressive ways. But Benison says that women are just as competitive. She argues, women are just as aggressive as men, just in cleverer, more fascinating ways. I mean, girls, we are more cunning in how we compete, aren't we? Slighter of hand. And I'm not sure why it took 25 years to conclude that women are cleverer than men. I mean, most of us have known that for a while, right? But the research proves that this constant competition and comparing is prevalent in every person. Now, when we're constantly competing and comparing, we tell ourselves, I have to look better, be more successful, have more power, keep a cleaner house, raise better kids than you to feel good about myself. And the result? Well, one of two things happens. If we're competing and I see myself as coming out better than you, I'm filled with pride. I mean, I build a false sense of security in the labels I'm wearing. And this can also fill me with fear because I'm afraid that if I don't maintain it, that I'll be seen as second rate overnight. I mean, we feel desperate to stay ahead. Now, if I compete with you and end up feeling less than, I am filled with shame. I walk around with this nagging sense that I'm not enough. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but is anyone out there with me on that? I mean, does anyone feel like they're not enough sometimes? Well, since it's Mother's Day, let me speak to the moms who are listening right now. I mean, I've known a few moms in my life, and many of them wrestle with feeling as if they're not enough. I mean, they wrestle with the labels they're wearing, the ones they've been given, the ones they put on themselves. It seems many moms struggle with comparing themselves to their perception of, of the perfect mom at the park. Now, guys, you wrestle with this stuff too, but we'll save that for Father's Day. Now, let me let you in on a secret you probably already know. That perfect mom, she's wrestling with the same labels too. I mean, she lives with that same who am I question and often struggles to find a satisfying answer. Let me say to every one of us, you are so much more than the labels you might be wearing. You don't have to find your identity in those things anymore. It is possible to step away from the competition and comparing to discover the truth of who you are. And this is that truth. You are God's adopted son. You are God's adopted daughter. You are a child of God. That is your primary identity. And what does that identity imply? Well, first, being a child of God means my past is in the past. Your past is in the past. All the ways that we've messed up and screwed up and failed to measure up, they don't define us anymore. Paul reminds us, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. All that shame that you've carried, you don't have to carry it anymore. I mean, who you were, it doesn't define you anymore. You are God's adopted son. You are God's adopted daughter. You are a child of God. You are enough. And being a child of God also means my identity is given not earned. I mean, all that striving, all that competing, all the ways we knock each other down to try to lift ourselves up, we can let go of that now. I mean, there's no room for pride in being a child of God, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I am a child of God, but so are you. And we can both rejoice in that without having to compete against one another. And uh, being a child of God is an identity that is timeless. It is permanent. In fact, like a priceless work of art that never loses its value with the passing of time, you are God's masterpiece. I mean, you are God's Mona Lisa. You're God's David. You're God's Sistine Chapel. When he looks at you, he sees something of inestimable value. You are God's adopted son. You're God's adopted daughter. You are a child of God. That is your true identity. Our identity is defined by something that's already been done. 
But I know uh, casting off our old labels and living into that identity is a journey. On this Mother's Day, we asked a mom, Amber, uh, if she would share her experience of that journey. Amber's a friend of mine, and, and I wanted to read her story to you in her own words. I just celebrated my 38th birthday. I love birthdays. I love celebrating life and the life of those that I love. What's hard for me is celebrating me. You see, I've spent the last 38 years of my life, yes, that's my whole life, feeling like my life isn't worth celebrating. I'm the oldest of three girls. My mom and dad were married less than two months before I was born, which was just a few months after my dad's divorce from his first wife was finalized. So as you can see, you don't get the perception that I was planned. To me, this is always translated into how I perceive my worth. My mom and dad divorced when I was 11 years old, and this was after a fairly, fairly stressful marriage riddled with addiction, lies, cheating, and unfaithfulness. Because of their addictions, I often felt like I took a backseat to everything. I wasn't a priority. My life wasn't worth giving up their addictions. My dad was granted full live-in custody of my sisters and I, which meant we lived with him full time. My mom had joint custody, meaning she was to have us every other weekend. However, we rarely saw her. We would wait for hours on a Friday night for her to come pick us up, waiting, waiting, waiting. She never came. She never called. She just didn't show. These actions settled me into a life of feeling worthless. I'm not worth your time. I'm not worth your commitment. I'm not worth you being my friend. If my mom can't even find me worth spending time with, why in the world would anyone else? Well, this past September, I began a small group called The Ultimate Journey. I spent 12 weeks with a leader and two other women journeying through my past, and we all unpacked the many lies that we have believed for our entire lives. I began to realize that this label of unworthiness I was wearing wasn't the truth about me. I had to work through the pain and the hurt to really begin to realize this is not how God sees me. It's not how others see me. If I want to be set free and allow God to truly work through me, I have to drop the label. I have to see myself as worthy, worthy of love, of friendships, of the many, many blessings that God has given me and continues to bestow. I wish I could say that since I've discovered the label I've been wearing is a lie, that I have this newfound confidence about myself. I don't, but I'm working on it. You see, I lived with this label for 38 years, and it's going to take some time getting it off. But I'm committed to the journey of releasing it. I want to center myself in an understanding and true belief of how God created me. Each day, I'll continue to pray and read through the truths and affirmations about who I am from God, rewiring the thinking that held me under a label of unworthiness. I am God's eternal beloved one. He has known me, chosen me, and done everything to provide for me since before the creation of the world and he wants me to know that. You are God's adopted son. You are God's adopted daughter. You are a child of God. I mean, think about the labels you wear. I mean, where have you searched for your identity? What labels have you worn? Isn't it time to rip up those labels? I mean, those things, no, no matter if they lead us to pride or shame, they don't define us anymore. They don't tell us the truth about ourselves. No, you are God's adopted son. You are God's adopted daughter. You are a child of God. You are God's masterpiece.